everybody can sort of see a board, um, one of our information boards in the park. Um, my, on my screen, it's all black on the left-hand side, but I think you can see it. And if you know where it is, that what I've done, I've done the flowers in a, a long, a definite route, so that if you want to follow that route, you can. But all of them, I think just about all of them, grow somewhere else except on that route, and quite a lot you'll find out outside the cemetery park itself. But um, for those who don't know where this sign is as a starting point, this history sign, it's um, along the main path that goes right around the cemetery park. You start at Southern Grove and follow it. And after a while, after the first slide, you come to a hill and you go up and over the hill. And at the bottom of the hill on your right is this sign. So that's where you're starting. And diverging from that sign to your right again, you'll see two paths. Now you, you take the right hand path and that, that's where the walk starts now. Um, and the flowers I'm going to talk about, they all, they sort of occur along, along the route in the, in the sequence in which I talk, talk about them. But so many of them, I talk about them in one place and they crop up again in later places and in lots of other places. But that's what I've done. So that if you want to, want to follow it, this is the, you know, that's where you start from and you, you go down the path which we in area that we have in the last couple of years tied up with our world war one celebrations come to call flanders hollow because there's a route there with many graves public graves of first work of, of people who served as far as i know they're all men people who served at in the military in the First World War. Um, so they're, they're, meant, they're, they're sort of, that's, that's what that path represents. Everything I'm talking about is on the left-hand side of the path. Now, the, so we'll take that path for a while and I'll tell you when we deviate from it for the route. Now, what I'm, what I'm going to, uh, where are we? Uh, plant number one look at my look at my scribbles as soon as you leave that panel as soon as you start walking on a path you, you'll meet a plant that probably nearly everybody knows cow parsley um it's a it's a tall plant about usually about a meter tall and at the moment it's covered with tiny lots and lots and lots of tiny white flowers which are in umbels and, and they're and umbels are quite characteristic of the carrot family to which it belongs. So to say it's a pretty obvious plant, but one or two things to say about it. My picture? Uh, I think, can we move on to the cow? Have we got, no, we don't have a plant for the, no. what I've done, some of the very ob, because there's only a limited capacity to put pictures on here, some plants that are very obvious, you can't mistake them, they haven't illustrated, so we haven't illustrated cow parsley, That's illustrated right. most of them. But one of the things about cow parsley often grows in the woods, and it, its trick it is um, to do most of its work in the winter and spring. A lot, of, a lot of woodland plants, a lot of plants that can grow under deciduous trees, which are leafless in the winter, a lot of them, that's their trick. What, so cow parsley, the leaves start to come up mostly about November, some come up earlier, and the plant grows through the winter and in April and May it flowers and it sets its seeds and then it dies, like a daffodil, it dies right back to the ground for the summer and comes up again the next November. So that's a trick for avoiding that shady period of the summer when, when, the, uh, when the leaves overhead are thick. So. Um, just a couple of things that might be worth saying about it is that people sometimes when they're foraging they they worry about mistaking parsley and hemlock we don't actually have any hemlock in the cemetery park but if you are doing that walk look at the cow parsley stems and you'll find things first of all they never have any spots on them and secondly they're kind of ridged 
that they're not kind of a smooth stem, they're ridged round. But if you take a hemlock, it always has spots on its stem and it is not ridged, it's perfectly smooth all the way around. So if you're worried about mistaking cow parsley for hemlock, that, that's, that's a clue. Um, now, I think the, the next plant, let me look at my list of, what was, what was my next, I think I'm ready for my next plant, which I think is garlic mustard, wasn't it? Um, okay. No, no, it, it's, it's wood avens. Right. Now, this, this, this little plant, you can, I've got it particularly to show you the flower. Um, it's a little, these small yellow flowers, which appear singly, now, it's a relative of, it's in the rose family, so it's a relative, ah, we're back to that one then. It, it's a relative of strawberries, blackberries, and, and roses, but the flower looks a little bit like a strawberry flower, only it's yellow rather than white. Now, the, the thing, what I wanted to just tell you about wood avens in particular, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, if you're a forager, and it, it, it's a very common plant, so it, it is safely forageable. Um, if you're a forager, in the winter time, possibly in the spring, Ken can tell you more than I can, um, the root actually has a smell and taste of cloves. Not, not, a, not as strong as the real cloves, but that's, that's the taste, so quite interesting. But what I did want to say, you can see the little five petal flower there. Now, that one thing to say about plants in general, they've all, got, they've all got their tricks to survive and prosper. And some of those tricks, you know, are shared by lots of plants. Others are pretty peculiar and pretty singular. They're often using one part of the plant for what you don't normally think of as its normal purpose. And wood avens has a special trick. In the center of that flower is, is where the seeds will develop. And on each, on each seed, when they're in flower like that, there's what they call the style, which is the female part of the flower, which takes pollen to pollinate the seed. Um, on most plants, when, when that's been done, the, the style simply falls off but it doesn't fall off on the wood avens. What, what it actually does, it gets, it gets bigger, it gets thicker, it gets very firm, and it develops a hook on the end. And what that, it, what that means is that when an animal brushes past a seed head of wood avens, it's quite likely to pick up, pick up seeds and maybe disperse them later. So, um, it, it's, it's one way of developing a hook. There are many different ways of developing a hook, um, but that's, that's a pretty singular one. I mean, another one that's well known, that's quite different, is people, a lot of, most people will know burdock. We're not gonna show you burdock today, but burdock doesn't develop a hook on the, the actual seeds are perfectly smooth, but they're inside a case, which is a tough, tough case, which is covered in little hooks. And most people will have experienced picking up those little picking up those seed cases. So, so the whole seed case is picked up, and then then as the person or dog goes along, the seeds are gradually dropped out. So, so seed dispersal is one of the things that plants have to do, and that's Wood Avon's way of doing it. So, now we'll have the next one, please, Ken. Garlic mustard. You'll see a lot of this flower at the moment. Um, it, it, it's actually a cabbage family plant. You might not you you might not think so, but one clue is the four petal flowers. They're not unique. Four petal flowers are not unique to cabbage family plants, but all cabbage family plants have four have four petals. Um, this this plant's just coming into flower. You 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 can see in, in the centre. In the centre of the clusters, there are lots of buds that haven't opened yet, and the, the leaves might even remind you of something of a nettle, but they don't, they don't sting you. But garlic mustard you find everywhere, especially at the edge of woods, and it's flowering now, and it's one of, it's one of the plants which has a life cycle which is called biennial. What that means is that it only flowers once, and when it's flowered, 
it ripens its seeds and then it dies. But the biennial means that it takes two years to two years to do that, two years to go from plant to plant. Foxgloves are a similar plant and um, honesty is another one and there are quite a lot of others. Uh, now, what you can't see in that particular picture is, is you can see the clusters of flowers, but what happens a bit later on is that each flower develops into a long, thin green pod. It's not very long at first, but it gets longer and wider as it grows. Um, and then the, the stem of the flower this elongates so that each pod has its own space. If it didn't elongate, all the pods would be clustered there like that, but they don't. The stem gets longer and longer. Many other plants do this. The stem gets longer and longer, so the pods stick out from the side of the stem up quite a distance. And one of the singular things about that is that the caterpillars of the orange tip butterfly, that's their most important food plant, and they actually eat the pods. They don't and they can't, as far as I know, eat the leaves, but they eat, they eat the pods as they ripen. Um, so as they get big, when they start, the pods are tiny and nice and tender. They grow and the pod grows and more or less keep pace. And I think they, the pod will get a bit more indigestible, but as they get bigger, they can cope with that. So um, I think that's, that's garlic mustard. So if we can get the next one, Ken. Right, now, aha, that was a nice one. That's a, that's a very nice picture. This is little wild geranium called Herb Robert. Wild geraniums have five petals. I think you can just about see that there. Um, Herb, Herb Robert is, is nearly always pink, but just sometimes you get plants which are white. And I think Ken's obviously picked that picture because there happen to be some white ones there as well. They're, 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 now, what, what you can actually see very well on the right of the picture, very, actually, this is really good. Um, you can see two, two pods coming up, one much bigger than the other. And if you look at some of the other heads, you'll, you'll see that some of them have, there's one flower and there's one not in flower. Uh, and that's because th this plant, there are often patterns in plants that you don't, you, don't, you don't notice unless you look for them. And what the, what the um, Herb Robert does is it develops its flowers in twos like this. I think as far as I know, they're always in twos. And always one develops before the first one. So the, the first one is nearly always finished and dropped its petals before the second one opens. Um, so that keeps a plant flowering over a longer period. Um, the other thing that, that, that is remarkable about any wild geranium is um, Herb Robert and, and all the others is that that long, on the right, that, that long pod isn't full of seeds that there are it looks as if it, it looks like just like another seed pod doesn't it but at the base of it you can't see it's hidden within the sepals there at the moment at the base of it the, there there are five seeds clustered around the base now when when the um, when they're ripe that thing that looks like a pod um actually explodes outwards suddenly it explodes when it's ready and each of the five seeds which are held in a little literally a little bucket at the at the bottom of the bottom of its section of that that pod um so that it splits into five and the five seeds which are quite large are thrown out some distance not maybe maybe a meter maybe a meter and a half but this explains, a lot of people are familiar with this plant because it crops up everywhere and it often in patches. And the reason it's in patches is that, that one plant can start and um, because it can fling its seeds a metre or a metre and a half, it can, uh, it can soon form a patch. I, I think one of the other remarkable things about this plant is that it's one of the most adaptable of all wildflowers. You, you can generally find some of them flowering at almost any time of year. 
You can find them flowering deep in the woods. You can find them flowering out on rocks and walls in the full sunshine. And when they're doing that, the leaves usually turn red. And um, they, can grow in, they can grow in all sorts of places at all sorts of times and all sorts of soils. And they're just extremely adaptable. It's the great secret of their success. So I think we could move on to the next one. Sorry to interrupt you, Terry. Can I just say, I think there's, we're hearing a bit of rustling. It might be the papers near the, the computer uh, or laptop. So just, me, just be careful if that's yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I've, got me, I've got me reminders scribbled on paper. Cool. And so it's only when I took, I won't pour it too much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, I'll try to turn it over carefully. I've just turned it over, right? So, Herb Robert, what's my next one? It's Red Campion. Yeah, this is another five petal plant in in the pink family. Um, you, you'll see that along that trail and you'll at now, and you'll also see it in many other places. So red, red campion, what's one of the things that's distinctive about that is one of a quite a small minority, possibly four or five percent of flowering plants that have totally separate male and female plants. So the male plants, they cannot produce seed. Um, the female plants rely on pollen being carried by insects from a male flower to a female flower. Um, I can see that, that that is a male plant because I can see that the, what's the, at the base of the flower is very thin. And if you were to squeeze that, you'd find there's a sort of nothing in there because there isn't, there are no seeds developing. But if you've, got a, if you've got a female plant, well, the whole thing looks a bit sturdier. And if you squeeze the base, you'll, you'll feel something solid. And that's the developing seed pod, which gets obviously bigger and bigger as it, as it does. So, so the distinction of red campion is having separate sexes. And um, lovely plant, very attractive to butterflies, bees, etc. And also, it, it, it produces seed pods which have quite a lot of quite large seeds in there all held in a pod which is like a kind of urn it, it sort of open it's when it's ready it opens at the top and the seeds can just spill out but but there's a, at least a dozen that actually their living is is to eat the seeds of campion and closely related plants as they um, as they develop when the mother moth will lay the eggs when the seed pod is still very small and green and soft. And the little caterpillar can burrow inside and start eating them and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And in many cases, they eventually get bigger than the seed pod itself. Now, how do they cope with that? Well, what they do is they said when they've exhausted something, they simply move out, find another pod and eat the seeds in there. So that's a curious way of life. Um, I think, move on, yeah. Ah, this is a nice one, the, the nice picture. Wow. You, you should still be able to, you should still be able to see this. It, it's getting to the end of the uh, Flanders Hollow Path when you're coming back out to another path. On your left, there's quite a lot of this. now. I think actually what's good about this is that the, the plants vary, the leaves of plants vary one from another. Sometimes they're plain, like the leaves on the, on the left, and sometimes they're sort of more or less marbled, sometimes more strongly than that, like the leaves on the right. So the leaves vary, but it's one or two species of heirloom lily in this country. It's not the common one, but despite the name, it is actually a native plant. You might think it wasn't, but it is. Um, it, what, you, what you get there is what you can see, you should still just about be able to see now, this very peculiar flower. Um, and on the right, you've got, later on, you've got seeds. But the, the, um, that, that air and flowers are very odd because you, you, you've got this hood or cowl and the whole, this plant has, well, arum lilies, I think, have more common, more 
different names than any other plant because they're so distinctive. And some of those names are really uh, quite rude. If I quote one of them, they're often called Priest's Pintle. Um, as a, or, or sometimes they're called Jack in the Pulpit. But the, I, if I don't, I'm not sure what a Pintle is, but some of you may know. Um, the, the, uh, but what happens with that? That, that, that thing, it, it's kind of an allure to the insects. It gives off, gives off smells, smells that little flies like, not sweet smells. What the little flies do is they, they come along, I think possibly mainly at night, I'm not quite sure, and they, they go down into the base of the eye. Um, and when they're down there, they can't get out straight away as, as it happens because the, before they have to pass through hairs round the, round the, round the flower stem and the hairs are pointing downwards so they can go past them but when they try to come back up they can't so and they they're held in there possibly for the best part of a day and then the hairs wither and they can come out but what they do is when they come if they've been to another plant first they will bring pollen with them so they'll pollinate that plant and when they are eventually released, the first thing they'll do is go to another one and have another 24 hours of imprisonment. Um, but they'll take the pollen with them. So that's the pollination mechanism. And if you break one open, you can see tiny green things around the stem, which are the seeds. And um, in due course, by August, they're like that. They're, they're ripe and red. Uh, normally, the leaves have died away before they're red like that. Um, but they stand up red, they're eaten by birds, they poison birds, but they don't poison us. I mean, wrong way round. They, po they don't poison birds and they do poison us. So don't quote me on that. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be in big trouble. <laughs> anyway, and what happens is they, they, um, they, the leaves have gone, but the leaves have normally gone by the time they're fully ripe. But in September, the leaves start coming up again. The, the other, the other era and the more familiar one that's found everywhere, um, the leaves don't come up until about December or January, but the, this one does. So it, like the, like the cow parsley, it's using, it's using the good light in the winter time. So, uh, how are we doing for time? I wonder. And let me just check. Check the time. Oh, no, I better move on. I've got a few optional ones here, but I'll skip that one. You near the air and the list, you'll see a lot of three cornered garlic, not illustrating. It's a mat, it's a plant that looks like a white bluebell, but it's not. And it, um, it, uh, it, it grows in very dense patches because it increases very rapidly from little bulb, new little bulbs, and from seeds. So it, you might regard it well it's often quite invasive the the uh, i'll turn my page and sorry sorry for the rustling boom 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 now i won't turn it yet what what you do now you've come just about to the end of that um, that um flanders hollow path so you turn left there going out towards cantrell road and the gate now when you go out when you cross the field, there are two plants that I'm picking out that you can see there. The first is white dead nettle, which I think we, there we go. Right. White dead nettle, a very familiar plant. Um, and you can see the flowers that, and you can see where you, on the right, there are open flowers. On the left, there's a stem that's already had all its flowers and Round stem, you've got these little spiky rings. They don't, they're not, they're not uh, sharp spiky. The little spiky rings, um, each little, that they consist of quite a number of separate, um, separate kind of seed pods. Which seeds are formed inside there. Um, and each one, each bit, each separate bit has four seeds. But the flowers, what, what's, what's interesting about the flowers is that they've got, they're in the mint family and like, some, like many members of the mint family, they've got a flower with a hood and a lip. Now, in the white dead nettle, it's very, it's very pronounced. You can see the 
there's a big hood and, and a, a lip you can't see quite as well, but it's quite big too. Um, and what happens, they're pollinated by bumblebees. The bumblebee go, goes into the flower, sits on the bottom lip, and it, it dips its proboscis in and gets nectar from the bottom flower. And it, it gets pollen from the black anthers. It gets pollen on its head. It doesn't care about that, but it just goes off with the pollen. And when it goes to another flower, some of that pollen will come off on another flower and pollinate it. Um, it's, so it, it's got um, white dead nettle, like all members of the mint family, has got square stems. Um, unfortunately, some plants in other families also have small stems, but every, every member of that family has got a square stem. You can't always make that kind of generalization. Um, we'll move on to the next one. Aha, now th this, this delicate, lovely little flower, it's a great favorite of mine, wonderfully, you know, exquisite shades of blue and everything. It's a very low creeping sort of plant um, uh, uh, called Germanda Speedwell, as you can see. Tiny flowers, four, four petals by the looks of it. Yes, four petals. Um, and it, you can find that in lots of places. You can, you can actually find it on mown grass if it's not been mown too recently because it's so low that it, it sort of escapes underneath the mower. Um, but you should see it in the field on your right and you'll see it subsequently on the walk. Um, provided, if you take the walk, provided it's reasonably warm and a bit bright, because if it's, if it's cold and cloudy, the flowers will more or less close up and they're much harder to spot. Um, anybody who watched Mark Patterson's Bee Talk last week, he mentioned this plant quite a lot because he, he told us that it's pretty important nectar plant or pollen, nectar and pollen plant to quite a few solitary bees, as I understand it. So, Germanda Speedwell. Um, so move on to the next plant. Aha. Now, this, this, the first place you'll come, well, the most obvious, easiest place to see this is if you've carried on towards Cantrell Road and you've just gone through the Kissing Gate, on your left, on the bank on your left, you will see a lot of, quite a lot of this plant. You'll see it in other places as well, but it's another campion like, like, like the red campion, but it's got quite a few differences. One, one difference is that it doesn't have separate male and female plants. They, they each flower is male and female. So, uh, and what, what you also get is that the bladder, the obvious thing that looks like a bladder, I think it's actually the, the sepals of the plant, but sepals are some, of, often separate, but in some plants they fuse together, and that's what's happening there. So you've got that, that strange bladder. I haven't really thought about what its function might be. And it's, uh, yes, it's always white. So uh, I think if you can look at those, you can see the separate, I, I think if you look what's projecting from the flowers, I think the long one is going to be the style, the female part of the flower, and the shorter ones are going to be the stamens, which give off the pollen. So, and, and you can also see how the, um, how the bladder is kind of delicately striped. Some, sometimes the bladder is quite pinkish, purplish in colour, but not on that plant. So I think we can turn to... And we're going to now cross the road into Scrapyard Meadow and there's a path directly across that points you up to the top. Now, what you'll see at the moment in the grass, especially on your left, but there's, this plant is called crosswort and it, it's a member of the, what, what they call the bedstraw family, to which uh, one, one of the members of that family that most of us know is going to be the goosegrass or cleavers, which are... Uh, in the cemetery park, we devote quite a bit of effort to keeping that under control. The, the um, but goosegrass is a, goosegrass is an annual plant. So when goosegrass is flowered and seeded, it dies and leaves its seeds behind it. But this one, well, it flowers and seeds, but it doesn't die. It, it, it its roots stay alive and it comes back. We can go back to the crossword if we would. We can go. Um, 
the roots stay alive and next spring it sends up the new growth again now what is called cross work because you can't see that that well on that picture but the leaves are in groups of four, so they form a cross. This is why it's crossword. Um, and there are loads and loads and loads of these tiny yellow flowers. So if you're, if you're walking up the slope to the, to the seat at the top of Scrapyard Meadow, and in quite a few other places in the park, you'll just see this yellow suffusion through the grass. And so that, that's the crosswork. The crosswork is a creeping plant, so it creeps over quite large areas. And so we can move on now, I think, to the next one. Next one, I'm going along now. People who know the park at all will know where the labyrinth is. But if they've followed, the, gone up to the top, and then, then you've turned left. You'll come to the labyrinth, the chalk labyrinth. Now, in the bird's foot trefoils just coming into flower, it, it, it's a flower sometimes known as bacon and eggs because you, when you get the reddish, You've got the reddish buds turning into yellow flowers. And in some plants, the flowers have a lot of red on them as well. But it, it's, um, it's just, the, there's a lot of it on the labyrinth, but it's, and it's just begun now. Um, it's, uh, it's a pea family plant, as you can see. Imagine a pea or a bean flower or a laburnum flower. Uh, you can see the characteristic structure of a pea family plant. Um, it's a very important wildlife plant. It's a very good nectar plant, and it, it feeds, the, feeds the caterpillars of quite a lot of butterflies and moths, um, including common blue butterflies and, and burnet moths, day-flying moths, and many others besides. But the, um, and it, it's called bird's foot because when that little cluster of flowers, um, when each flower develops a pod, the pods kind of splay out rather like toes you know so they're like a long a long toed bird so that's why it's bird's foot trefoil so we will move on right now what we've done we've we've carried on the path past the labyrinth and it's taken us back onto cantrell road and when we go into we, we just when we've just gone through the gate on our left there's a little hill and on that hill at the moment there's a great deal of this plant which uh, i always think of as a dandelion job there are so many plants that look a bit similar and vaguely reminiscent of dandelions now this one i i really didn't get to know it until last year because there are so many of these and if you're lazy you, you get a bit slack about identifying them you just say this is a dandelion job and be done with it but i thought now this one coming up in lots of grass sometimes you see it in grass where bulbs have been grown so it's not been cut yet and thought this is interesting because most of these things come in the late summer so is this different you know although it looks like the others superficially it is different um and it's, it gets that rather strong i didn't know why it got that strange name because you can't see a beak on it but but what happens is that the seeds which form in a head like a miniature dandelion each each seed has a kind of extension which is not the seed itself um, but it's a little it can sort of carries on to about twice the length of the seed up, up to nearly a centimeter long of which only about a third is the seed itself and that's what they call the beak so th this plant is another biennial apparently it takes two years to get to that stage produces all its seeds and then it dies. But because they're wind blown, you may find this pretty well anywhere. And as far as I can tell, this is the only flower of that type flowering at the moment. So um, the other, it, one way of, not, the, not a unique way of checking it is if you look underneath those petals, the backs of them are not yellow, but they're a kind of dull orange color. So you, you often have to look at the whole flower to sort it out. Um, I think that the next plant is growing in the same place. I think this is the woad, isn't it? Now, that plant there, there's only one on that hill, but there are one or two more around the park elsewhere. It, it's a plant with a huge historical antecedent. This is woad, which um, 
a sort of cliched version of ancient history has ancient Britons covered in painting themselves blue with dye obtained from woad, but by quite a complex process to, to get that dye. Now, woad, until the 19th century, you wanted a nice blue dye you needed to grow woad. Um, so woad was very widely grown as a crop. But um, what happened in the middle of the century, the ingenuity of chemists found other ways of synthesizing a blue dye. And since they were a great deal cheaper, it was more or less curtains for woad. Although they still specialize in it in the district. If anyone goes to Toulouse, France, that was one of the major growing areas. And it still kept going as a kind of symposium piece. There's a shop in Toulouse that sells all kinds of products made from dyed with woad. Lovely blue colour. So woad's another biennial. That plant will die and produce dark brown seeds hanging down. And then, then it will die. And in two years' time, we may see its descendants. So very elegant and unusual plant. So that's, that's woad. Um, so what we do now is you, you will have, what, what you're doing is that you will have noticed, and you've got a post there, you've got the posts for the plants and people trail. Now you don't need to worry about that, but each post gives you a direction arrow on it. So when you've just passed the road and the beaks hawk speed, you turn, you turn right as the direction arrow tells you, and then you come to the, the next junction, and there's direction and avenue, not avenue, di direction arrow telling you to go left. Now, round there, there's a lot of this plant. This plant is greater celandine, which is nothing to do, apart from a coincidence in the name, with the lesser celandine, which is a buttercup. Um, so it's not a, this is a poppy rather than a buttercup. And one thing about poppies is that they have four petals as well, like cabbage family plants. But the the uh, plant there's a, there's mass there's a mass of it at, at the junction, and flowering now. What what you if you break a leaf open or a stem, what's un, one thing that's unusual about it is it has an orange juice inside, which once made it thought that it might be a cure for jaundice because if it's got an orange or yellow juice, well, perhaps that's what its purpose is. But one other thing that's really interesting about it is that it develops pods, which I don't think you see, I think that plant hasn't quite got to that stage. Well, the, I think that, yeah, perhaps uh, to the right of the left-hand flower, there's a pod, but it's not, it's not full size yet. It, doesn't, it gets fatter and a bit longer. Uh, when it's fat and ripe, if you open it up, you'll find the seed, each seed in there has got, it's a brown seed, but each seed has got a little body, a little white body attached to it. And that little white body is, is fat and it's nutritious. And ants are very keen on it. So they seek it out. They, they take off the whole seed with the, with the body. And sometimes they may eat, eat the body on the way to the nest and drop the seed or they may take it back to the nest and the, the the food will be taken off the seed and the seed itself which is not edible to the ants is thrown out so this plant gets itself spread by offering an inducement to the ants and they uh, yeah and some this is why sometimes you'll see it way up a wall um, as the ants will have carried it up the wall um, so that's the greater celandine, and we can move on, I think, to the next one. Right, now, along that bank, that is one of the places where we get um, a rather special wildflower, the wild columbine. That, I mean, we have introduced it to the cemetery park, and it wouldn't have got there by itself. But... That plant doesn't, that, that picture doesn't show it all that well, but when you, when you look at the flower, um, it's got, um, it's sort of got five sections to it and looked at individually, each one looks like 
it looks like a little bird. There's a broad fanning out tail. And I think you might be able to see it actually if you look closely. Broad fanning out tail coming up to a, a rather narrow but very bird-like top bird's head. That the, um, and it's called columbine because columba is the Latin word for a dove. So that is, it, so it's, it, it's the dove flower. Um, one, one other thing about columbine that some plants share is that sepals, which you, on most plants, you get sepals around the base of the flower, but usually they're green. But in some plants, they're the same color as the petals. And that's what happens in the columbine. The, the bottom bits are sepals, although they look just like pep petals. Um, so that's it, one of its oddities. Uh, now, I think we've got, we've got, have we got, was that the last one, Ken? That was the last one, Terry. Yeah. Well, let me, one, one more thing. Well, when you get, uh, you don't, there's no picture for this, but no. when you get to the sign, the actual sign that we started with, you will see underneath it a plant called honesty that most of you might know. It's got either purple or white flowers. Now, there is a plant right under the sign, which I, purple one, I think, and it did have flowers quite recently. But what you can see there is that uh, one thing that's distinctive about honesty is you get these, you get these seed heads, which are flat. They're about the size of a coin, you know, about the size, say, a 50 pence coin, except they don't have, the set, they've got, round edges they're a bit oval but inside them they have four or five seeds and as time goes on they they turn sort of whitey silverish and they can be blown by the wind quite a long way because the very flat thin pod it, the, can pick up the wind so that's how they that's how honesty disperses itself so that that's me it brought you back to the starting point and um you'll see a lot of other flowers on that route if you follow it Okay. Thank you very much, Terry. <laughs> very nice. Thank you. It's lovely. Um, so this is the Sorry, point the where <laughs> this is the point where if anyone would like to ask a question, they're welcome to turn their microphone off and ask. Otherwise, um, we're happy to work through the chat. But I think Susanna and Michelle have been dealing with most of them. Um, the only one I've seen, I think it's probably referring to the wild columbine from Linda. Is she saying so where is the blue it's just one of those quirks of describing nature where something isn't obviously blue as we see it but it's described as blue it's like the red red campion it's it looks pink yeah. but they call it red so yeah it's one of those quirks of describing nature well yeah and sometimes colors are not what they seem they produce um, some straight away you know yes. iridescent colors and things oh uh, no she was talking about the woad it's in the oh, um, yeah. i've learned a bit about this they used, oh, right. to, they used to need to use Soda, sodium ash or something to extract it from the leaves yeah oh yeah like cooking it and stuff they boil it's it horrible. up and it's, it's long, from the leaves it's a long process yeah. yeah from the leaves if anyone goes to Toulouse you'll get the whole process explained in the World Museum yeah yeah it should be still there I think it's probably closed at the moment but might, I might add um, are but, there any questions we've missed Michelle and Susanna as you've been working through the chat yeah, just Jenny recently asked, how do you tell a hawk bit from a hawk beard? Well, that's a hawk. That's a hawk's beard. Um, well, I can't answer that question authoritatively because I, I do get lazy about the many, many, many hawk bits, hawk's beards, hawk weeds. And only when I've sort of really got my attention drawn to some particular thing do I try to diet do it out all i can say is get a decent flower book and look at what they tell you to do i can't really tell you that great and just lots of people saying thank you so much how great the talk oh, is they're, as they're as per them. usual um if anyone wants to write any more um questions in the chat or if you want to kind of wave your arms around and ken can unmute you i think naomi's got something to say oh well there we go Okay. We recommend a good Thank you, Terry. But mm -hmm. I didn't understand the picture with the air and lily and the plant uh, beside it. The, uh, the jack in the pulpit. Well, well, the thing is that's that's the fruit of the same yeah. plant. They they were the same plant at different times, right? The but one I on the left. That was the flower. That I was the flower of the air and lily. 
I no? know the Aram Lily from South oh, Africa. Yeah. Pardon? I know the Aram Lily from South Africa, where it's very widespread and grows yeah. in swampy areas. Yeah. That's the white one, isn't it? Yes, but I don't recognize the the fruit part. Well, well, I don't know what the fruit of that white one is like, but um, but the the um, but that is what what happens. Is that's quite like that Aram that you're familiar with, except that the the, the sheath is kind of green rather than white. But, that's right. And I think a similar sort of pollination thing. Now, I don't know what the fruit of the white one is like at all. I've not ever noticed it. In fact, we've got, I, I don't know why, we've got a neighbour who's got some up the road, but they don't seem, I, I haven't ever noticed the fruits. But, but, but what happens is that if you break open, you know, if you broke the flower open, you'd see round the base of that strange protrusion, the, the you'd see this whole bundle of tiny tiny green seeds mm -hmm. the other ones that, but but what happens then is that the i don't know whether the white one withers away well it does wither away doesn't it after flowering but that one the green hood withers right away and and then those little green those little green fruits get bigger and bigger and in the end they turn red. I mean, it may be that the fruits of the the white hair and turn some other colour, or don't, or don't change colour at all. They may be green. Yeah. I don't, does that sort of clear it up a bit? Yeah, I'll, I'll look at it. It is it's a related yeah. plant, but it's a different one. But it's called the nomenclature is the same. Well, in in common parlance, yeah, they they each have their own scientific names, but but you know, people talking about plants in general terms you know yeah well it's not systematic and you know tend to call them all arum lilies even though they're yes. they're different they're, they're different species but they're related but they're different yeah thank you thanks Lovely. anybody right. else want to wave their arms about <laughs> I saw a thing from jenny about something about pink geraniums just flashed up on the text yeah, I really regret not taking a photo. There's a plant I haven't noticed in the cemetery before, and it looked to me like a, a very small sort of uh, relative of the crane's bill family. A uh, small one, yeah. But it's very pale pink, because usually when I think of that family, I think they're usually like, you know, the colour of meadow pairing crane's bill or a sort of herb robert colour, but it's very pale. Yeah, no, I'll tell you what that might be. It... it, it, it at, at this time of year, you've got a plant called Shining Cranesville, which isn't very big, ah. but quite tiny, and it's very often growing. It, it, it's capable of growing where there's hardly any soil. There's quite a bit of it around the base of the Westwood Monument, for instance. So it would, uh, but that I don't know if you've seen it, but it's not very. It's not very tall, and the flowers are tiny and they're a pale pink, but it's. Um, it's what it does it, it it can grow where there's almost no soil because it it sits the summer out the seeds don't germinate till about october then they grow through the winter they flower now set their seeds and in a few weeks time they'll be dead so they're avoiding the heat of the summer and um that i think that might be the plant you've got the, the flowers are smaller than herb robert flowers and there's but there's quite a few of them no, the flowers are a bit bigger, so I looked that up. So that's good. I was looking at that the other day and didn't know what that was. No, I'll have to uh, find it and send you a photo. There's a few patches of it in the cemetery. But, it, but you, you reckon it's, it, it, is the plant itself bigger than, bigger than Herb Robert? Because I know a pink flower Yeah, it's sort of like a, a clump. But it, it looks to yeah. me like a, a relative of the geranium. But I'll, I'll send you, I'll, I'll send yeah. you some of the photos. Well, sorry, I'm yeah. wondering if they're the pink ones that were mistakenly delivered to us when we ordered etched cranes bills and we got those pink we got those pink ones along the edge of memorial glade that have popped up where we were hoping they'd be etched or penciled cranes bills i wonder if jenny's referring to those <laughs> they're a, they're a hybrid they're the mistake plants <laughs> yes yeah, yeah they're, they're a hybrid um, but they flower for a very long period yeah what do you remember they what they were they were hybrid between Street Cranesville and something else, weren't they? Yeah, because we got the London Natural History Society Botany Field Group to have a look at it, and they they were they were struggling with it a little bit. 
<laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. I've asked you two taxing questions. If, so. if, it were, if it was, if it was, if it, if it's the same one that you're thinking of that I'm thinking of, um, yeah, we know that uh, the NHS had a bit of trouble getting the bottom in it out with a key. So. <laughs> and if you okay, want to stop the this, questions, if you want <laughs> yeah. to have an answer. One of its parents, they said, is is this plant called streaked or penciled cranesbill, which has a very pale pink flower. There's lots oh. of it, but it's got delicate sort of pinkish veining on the petals, which is the penciling or the, or the streaking. So that's one of the parents of that plant. And there's lots of that too. So if you're wandering around, you'll see that now and all summer. You'll see both of them all summer. Okay, just having a quick look at that one. All right. Oh yeah, could be that. Yes, I think it's that one, Terry. I yeah. think it's the pencil cranes book, oh, good. or maybe the. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Which you. In the book. Oh well, people can look it up. They know the name. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. How will we know when it's available? Somebody says. Uh, so I've, I've answered that. So we 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 sorting all that out, putting out all right, okay. online. Okay. Yeah, we're working all that right. out. There's a bit of editing to doing them, and we're doing them kind of bit by bit. But there's website changes happening as well. Yeah. So there are things. Yeah, so Phil, if you if you I don't know if you follow our social media, if you follow us on Facebook or Instagram, but we'll definitely announce it on there. If not, I'd just recommend if you could just keep checking in with our or the newsletter if you want to sign sign in uh, sign up for the newsletter, anybody? Susanna's yeah. just put the link in in the chat. Yeah. Um but yeah, yeah, otherwise just maybe um check in with our yeah. our website, which is where that link directs to as well. But at the minute, we don't have an exact time frame of no. when it when it will be available. I'm a friend. We're just very dependent on a volunteer for that at the moment. Um, Gary said, completely off topic, but would anyone know a flower shop open in the area? I'm assuming area is Tower Hamlets area. I could make one suggestion that we're not very well served in Tower Hamlets for actual garden centres. Yeah. You know. But if you can, if you can see you looking to a B and Q. Most B and Q shops have a very extensive garden section and lots and lots of stuff. I mean, there's one at Beckton. I don't know where they are, but whether you could see one well, Tottenham, and there may be others closer. So B and B and Q would be one recommendation. Where you, you know they'll have a whole big outdoor section, and then gotcha. they'll have yeah. seeds inside. They'll have house plants. They'll have tools. They'll yeah. have the works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah? Thank you and so much, and thanks for the talk. It was fantastic. Oh, yeah. It's really, really nice. Thanks, thanks, Gary. If you just look in the chat now, some of the other participants have been um, recommending some places that might be oh, open right. tomorrow or things like that. So just take a look. Yeah, and as you say, they get seeds by post from the seed merchants. Yeah. yeah. Good. Lovely. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, certainly, if you want wildflowers, Naturescape is one of the suppliers of wildflowers. I just pay back on the cranes quill and I think we had a few exchanges today. So I think that penciled one, yeah. um, so there is a lovely one which is white are the petals and then there is really that penciling, so kind of a, a drawing on the petal which is which yeah. is kind of pinkish. And then there is the ones that are just more pink, so the, the, the petal is more uniform. So I guess they are the same kind and they're, they're 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 everywhere at the moment it's just that it's only once you get close to them that you realize they're not just white but they have this beautiful neat neat line in the petals and that there, there are quite a lot what there also are there's about seven or eight kinds of wild geraniums in the park but many of them are quite tiny they're smaller than herb robert and they're often down in the grass things like Dovesfoot Cranesbill, which is really minute. No? Yeah, yes, they're they're very they're very they're very tiny. You really need to look on on the ground, kind of thing. Yes, yeah. it's a good point. Say so thank you all very much for joining us and supporting the cemetery park and joining us online. Thank you, Terry, for all your yeah. wonderful enthusiasm and knowledge on wildflowers. Yeah.